Mm. I call the order the meeting of the Bills Committee on the Electro Legislation Miscellaneous Amendments Bill 2014. Can we inv ask the administration to join us, please? I won't introduce the team because I'm sure by now uh, you're familiar with them. We've only met with them a few days ago. Now, first of all, minutes of the uh, at the last meeting, rather, we started clause by clause examination of the bill. Uh, we'll start from page nine today of the marked up copy. On page nine, we were on. Um, 2A bracket 4 is about inclement weather. Under Secretary, is there anything else on uh, inclement weather? Can I ask uh, Mr. Mo or other colleagues to take that up, please? Thank you, yes, Mr. Mo. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have considered members' suggestion about the point on inclement weather or the use of the term. Actually, at the last meeting, we explained why we described it this way. Uh, or um, poor weather instead of inclement weather, or bad weather instead of uh, inclement weather. Why we chose to use bad weather instead of inclement weather. Um, so here we propose to make an amendment. We won't use the general description as we have done. Instead, we will quote directly from the relevant provisions. So uh, we will refer to Schedule 2, um, Clause 2, uh, Section 2, 3, 1. So um, subsections 2 and 3 are subject to Schedule 2, Section 3, 1. In that case, there is no need to describe the um, provisions. But since we won't describe the provisions, so in future when there are similar clauses, then we will be very careful to make sure we won't leave out any uh, corresponding amendments. Now on Saturday, some members uh, did not join this discussion. We're actually on Electro Affairs Commission, Electro Procedure, Legislative Council Regulation uh, 2A, bad weather. Now, um, so clause 4, it says bad weather, but then um, definition is uh, inclement weather. So it seems that uh, between inclement weather and bad weather, uh, it, it, uh, it's not clear if it's the same thing. And Saturday, members raised this point, and uh, the legal advisor thought it's better to make sure there's consistent um, description. So now you are going to do it this way. I think it's appropriate. So you will um, give us the revised wordings later, right? Yes. It's actually just um, description already in a certain provision. OK, let's move on to page 10 of the Chinese version. Section 7, the nomination period. Ms. Chung, thank you. For cl uh, Section 7 and Section 24, it's about um, the, um, the electoral procedure for legislative council. Uh, we have um, include, added some new sections uh, due to inclement weather, so these are corresponding amendments. Uh, section 4, we've added... Um, Subsection uh, section seven. We've added subsection four. That is, um, if uh, there should be delay in the um, due to uh, inclement weather for the nomination period, then that means it may not meet the requirement of uh, 21 days of nomination period. Uh, in the current legislation, it's said that uh, um, between 29 days and 42 days before the um, voting day, the nomination period should. Uh, uh, be closed, and if there's inclement weather causing any delay, it's possible. 
the nomination period may only end with um, within 28 days before the polling day. So that's why this point has to be made clear here. And then section 24 is also a corresponding amendment. Subsection 6, that's reference to a 10-year, 10 10-day 10 period. That means the election aid, um, the returning officer must send a notice of the particulars of uh, the election agent. This is a notice on the election agent. And subsection say, 6 says that the appointment must be made after the period of 10 days. Now, this 10-day period may also be delayed due to inclement weather. So that's why in subsection 6, we have changed the wordings period of 10 days to notice period. Because otherwise, uh, this would not be an accurate um, description. Page 12, Ms. Chung, thank you. Division 5 is about the um, electoral procedure for district council's elections. Um, for the new provisions um, added to the electoral procedure legislative council's regulation, they're very similar to the ones here, so let's see if you have any uh, views on that. So, for page 13, 14, and 15, there actually is the same kind of amendments, right? But just that this uh, set of amendments apply to the District Council election. So they're similar to the uh, provisions for the electrical election. If there are no questions, then... Let's move on to page uh, 14 and 15. Page 14 and 15, uh, they are also similar to the provisions for the electrical election. Okay, then, page 16. Thank you. Thank you. Page 16. Um, page 17 of the English version, that is, um, this is Division 6, Amendments to the YAC Registration of Electors Rural Representative Election Regulation. And uh, in fact, the um, proposals are similar to those in Division 2 and Division 3. Thank you. All right. Um, yes, uh, let's move on to page 18. This is a technical amendment only, Chairman. Now, there is a provisional register for the village representative election, and um, there will be a notice published uh, not later than the 27th of August every year. And um, the register will be available for public inspection till the 9th of September this year. But then concerning section 22, bracket 4, there is reference to a period of 14 days. And if we count the 14 days, starting from the 27th of August, then um, the date should be the 9th of September. But then a notice uh, may be published before the 27th of August. And as a result, um, if we count 14 days, the date will be before the 9th of September. And so we have this amendment to um, uh, make sure that it's the 9th of September. All right, so it's just to clarify the date. All right, page um 19 of the Chinese version and page 21 of the English version. Um, inclement weather. Um, um, is it that the um, uh, proposals are very similar? Yes, they are very similar to the amendments proposed under Division 4 and Division 5. Uh, you said very similar, but then are they the same? If there are differences, can you please point them out to us? Can you point out the differences to us, please? Yes. Uh, in fact, the uh, wording is more or less the same, Chairman. But then um, uh, the, the numbers may differ because we may be talking about different regulations. And then uh, may I refer to page 21 of the um, Chinese version. It says... If the, nom uh, the nomination period uh, may be lengthened, 
and I want to say that the number is somewhat different because we here we're talking about twelve days. All right, uh, our legal advisor, um, I'm sure will point out um, uh, points um, that we need to note um, to us. All right, um, next, yes, Chairman, page twenty-two, and that's Division Eight, Chairman, amendment to the Legco Ordinance. And concerning voter registration, there is section thirty-two, and that's why we have section thirty-two um, deadlines in relation to voter registration, and we have um, the provisions um, in relation to um, postponement because of inclement weather. So, um, from page twenty three to page twenty five, all right, or, or rather, that's only page twenty two. What about page twenty three then? Page twenty three, chairman, to page twenty five. Those are the um, these are very similar to um. New regulations on a vote uh, registration of electors, and the Division Nine relates to uh, amendments to registration of electors appeals regulation, and um, the uh, provisions here are very similar. Uh, are they very similar, or are they exactly the same? If there are um, differences in the numbers, can you please highlight those differences to us? Yes, Chairman. So again, there is. Um, Table one and table two, and we have table one. Now concerning the dates referred to in column two, they are packed to the dates referred to under column one. And so, uh, uh, if the date under column one is put back because of inclement weather, then the date under column, the corresponding date under column two, is put back um, accordingly. But of course, here under division nine, we're talking about this particular regulation. And then table two, chairman. Uh, again, uh, these regulations are very similar. Um, the uh, dates um, un uh, under column two represent the um, the day following the dates on uh, under column one, and so if the uh, date, if a certain date under column one is put back, then the date under column two is um, suitably um, put back to the day following the um, date. Under column one, and then there is a table three, chairman, uh, for the dates under column two or the sections under column two. They um, contain a reference to the dates mentioned under column one, and so if um, there is any putting back because of inclement weather, then again the dates under column two, the corresponding dates, need to be put back as well. Thank you. All right. Are there any questions from members? No. Then let's move on to uh, page twenty-six. Page twenty-six, no change. Page twenty-seven of the Chinese version, no change. Page twenty-eight, and that's page thirty-two of the English version. Yes, thank you. We are proposing a new four capital A, and I think I need to um, introduce the background to members. Now concerning the um, regulation, it's about a uh, lodging of complaints, um, claims, appeals, and the revising officer needs to fix a date for the hearing. And before the date of the hearing, um, written representations can be made to the revising officer. And concerning for um, capital A, B, um, it says that when people make rep written representations to the revising. Officer, then um, the um, there may be some delay because of inclement weather. 
Now, because the deadline should be the day before the hearing, and then if there is any、um, putting back because or postponement because of inclement weather, then the deadline、uh, will be the the. The day, the day、um, of the hearing. But then, if the representation is very simple, say for example, an electricity tariff bill, then the revising officer should be able to、um, handle it on the same day. But then, if、uh, the persons concerned um, provide um, very detailed and、um, complicated representations in writing, then the revising officer may want to postpone the hearing. In fact, under the Um, uh, um, present um, provisions. The revising officer、uh, already has the power to postpone the hearing. But then, taking into account the circumstances、uh, under four capital A, and that is、um, the date of the hearing has been fixed. Um. And、uh, because of inclement weather, the um, hearing um, is held um, um, on the day when the,、um, the, the dead、uh, there is the deadline. And the、um, but then the revising officer has received detailed representations in writing, and the revising officer may exercise discretion his ex- discretion not to hold the hearing on that day, and that、uh, hearing can be. Postponed to the next working day, which is not an inclement weather warning day. Following that postponed deadline. All right. Any questions? No. Then I think we can move on to page twenty nine. No changes. Page thirty. A chairman. In fact, on page twenty nine. Um. There are deletions to、uh, certain references to dates: twenty-one days, twenty-seven days, twenty-eight days. So,、um, if、um, there is postponement because of inclement weather, then it may no longer be twenty-one days, twenty-seven days, or twenty-eight days. Page. Thirty. So we have two、um, A, two B, and two C. And、uh, this is to cater for the extreme situation under four capital A.、Um, the hearing、um, has to be、uh, postponed further, and the revising officer may. Um, review this ruling. So under four capital A, we've already allowed the、uh, hearing to be postponed. And here we are saying that if we um, uh, um, encounter the situation outlined in four、um, capital. A. Then again, the、um, the review can also be postponed. And then two、uh, A and two B. These are the main provisions.、Um, if there is an extreme、um, situation, um, um, uh, um, and as a result, the、um, deadlines have to be、uh, postponed.、Uh, this is to make sure that. The、uh, ruling or the outcome of the review can be reflected in the、uh, voter register of that particular year. All right, no other questions. Then、uh, page thirty, please, Miss Chong. Page thirty-one. Um, Division Ten Chairman, and this is an amendment to the、um, ECICO. And again, there are provisions on inclement weather, and the format is the same as that.、Um, For the、uh, amendments to other ordinances, and in relation to the、uh, deadlines on the procedures, these are in、um, subsection two and subsection three. If there is inclement weather, then these、um, dates will be postponed. To the next working day, which is not an inclement weather warning day, following the last day. 
Next, we have um, the uh, amendment to the C election ordinance, page 32, and that's page 37 of the English version. This show. Yes, this is an amendment to the uh, C election ordinance. And the um, um, amendment uh, proposed is extremely similar to that proposed for the electrical um, election. So, this is in relation to the EC subsector um, election um, and the deadline. So we've got this uh, provision, and we've um, included this um, amendment on uh, inclement weather. All right, uh, page thirty-three again. Um, inclement weather. Um, this is uh, these are the amendments to the EC registration voters for subsectors members of election committee appeals um, regulation, and this is in relation to Cap five four two or similar to Cap five four two subsidiary legislation B. Um, the amendments are very similar. Now, as we are dealing with a different regulation, the numbers um, are not the same, but um, all the other parts, um, in fact, are the same. All right. Next, we have page thirty-four to page thirty-five of the Chinese version. And now let's move on to page thirty-six of the Chinese version. No change. Thirty-seven. No change. Thirty-eight. No change. Thirty-nine. No change. Um. Page uh, forty is strong. So this is very similar to Cap five four two subsidiary legislation B. We're talking about um, an extreme situation, and the hearing um, can be uh, um, postponed. So um, the amendment is very similar. But of course, um, uh, here we're talking about uh, an other regulation, and this is the regulation in relation to appeals. Page forty-one, no change. Forty-two, forty-three, I think it's just about the dates, right? Forty-two, some of the dates have been deleted. Uh, it's the same explanation as before, right? Uh, Twenty-eight days, whatever. For page forty-three again is about the period, uh, number of days. Uh, you won't refer to exact number of days. Um, so if there's delay caused by inclement weather, there would be a problem. If there's no not this amendment, there will be inconsistency. So uh, page 44 now, Ms. Chung. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Page 44 is the same as um, section 6 of uh, the um, Voters Registration Ordinance. Uh, similar. It's very similar. It's that in the extreme cases, the um, revising officer may review the appeal deadline to the original period, and um, these are just corresponding amendments. Page 45, Rural Representative Election Regulation, again, is to include uh, inclement weather. Ms. Chung. Division 13, Amendments to uh, Rural Representative Election. Uh, Division 13, rather, Amendment to Rural Representative Election, all the same to previous amendment. And this is about Section 17. And Section 17 is about um, the amendment to um, delay caused by inclement weather. Page 46. Also, rural representative election, but this is about appeals. It's the appeals regulation, Ms. Chung. Yes, uh, this appeals regulation again is similar to the that uh, for the voters' registration. We're proposing similar amendments. Uh, the new section one A. Well, it's not co as complicated, so therefore there may not be a need to use a list uh, to present this amendment. So. Um, for subsection 4, there's direct reference of the date and the relevant provision, and it will serve the same purpose. Thank you. Page 48. 
page 48, the new section 2A. It's the same uh, for the voters' registration appeals regulation that is in extreme cases, the date of hearing could uh, be uh, moved. So the amendment is very similar. Page 49. Page 49. This amendment is just um, a correction, really. For Section 6 3, it ref uh, refers to Section 7 2 in the same regulation. And in Section 7 2, there's a reference to the date uh, for review. But then for Section 6.3, when it refers to Section 7.2, it says the last day before that period, but it's not correct. Uh, it should actually refer to the actual date. So that's why we're making this correction. Questions, please? No? Page 50. Electrical geographical constituencies election. Yeah, page 50 is actually amendments to Division 3. Uh, to Part 3, rather. Uh, when, earlier, when we explained policy, we said we'll allow um, register, uh, voters who are asked to be deregistered to be included in the omission list. And uh, here, um, for the amendments in part two, that is a voters registration regulation for electrical and district councils, a section nine, the same in of part two, the same here. Here, part three, we propose to add a uh, subsection A B. It says here who could be included in the omission list. Apart from those in the existing uh, 9-1-A, we've added um, 9-A-B. That means for those uh, whose names are already in the existing final register, and uh, they, if they have signed a written notice, inform the electoral registration officer that they no longer want to be registered. So this is a new group of people to be included. Omission arrangement, fine. Page 51, no amendment. Page 52, Ms. Chung. Yes, Mr. Chairman, for page 52, it's just to um, uh, clarify the arrangement. That is, if there's a written notice from a voter saying that he does not wish to be registered anymore, then the electoral registration officer will have to acknowledge by register post of the uh, notice, that's all. Legal advisor, we asked the administration um, about the operation because there's the new sub clause A B. That's a page fifty uh, in the marked up version in Chinese, or page fifty seven in the English marked up copy. That is um, for someone who's not whose name is not in the existing final register, uh, but he's in the provisional register, but then he wants to change his mind, he doesn't want to be registered. In that case, his name will not be included in the omission list. And that's another scenario. Page 52 of the Chinese marked up copy, there's a new subsection 4A. The electoral registration officer must acknowledge by registered post the receipt of a notice. So for someone who no longer wishes to remain a registered voter. So if the uh, electoral officer, electoral registration officer sees that uh, the register post is returned, then how should it be dealt with? There's no mention of it. Ms. Chung, please. Perhaps I invite Mr. Lee to explain the um, operation to you. Yes, Mr. Lee? The legal advisor referred to two scenarios. Sorry, the speaker is off mic. Now, um, someone wants to um, withdraw his application, and then should that person be included in the omission list? The current 
arrangement is that if um, a name is on the final register for any reason he wishes to deregister, then the procedure to follow is to include his name in the mission list so he knows that his name will not be included in the next final register. But then for a newly registered voter, when he submits an application, uh, we would uh, process his application, but then he's not not yet a f um, registered voter. So we it's just about um, cancellation of a new application. So that's why the name does not appear on the omission list. So the current policy arrangement is that uh, this person will not be included in the omission list, and that's in line with the spirit of the current legislation. And another scenario, let's say a voter submits a deregistration application, and then we uh, process the application. Um, in accordance with the amended um, legislation, we will um, send him a registered post. It's just so he knows that uh, his uh, registration will be cancelled. But um, if, as legal advisor uh, suggested, for whatever reason, the registered post is returned to us, then in that case, we will definitely try to um, contact the voter to find out why the registered post is returned to us. Now, from past experience, uh, is, there's this possibility that, uh, let's say, the registered post is sent uh, to the person the postman is there, but no one signs a registered, sends the, the receipts, then the, a card will be left and ask the um, person to go and collect the registered post. But perhaps the person doesn't go and collect the registered post because it's busy or at work or whatever. But in that case, we will try to send again a registered post to him to make sure he will get the notice. If after we've exhausted all means to contact the voter and we still fail, then we will not uh, process the the registration application. Now, because the registered post is returned repeatedly, then we have reason to suspect whether this is the genuine address of the voter. In that case, we will not um, process the, the registration application, but rather we will start the process to verify whether this is the address of that voter, if this is the current address of that voter. Legal advisor, thank you, Mr. Lee, for your explanation for sub section clause A B. Um, persons on the provisional register. Um, now I have no further comments, but for registered post, now when uh, someone's name is on the omissions list, it seems that there is this condition. The electoral registration officer has to verify that the signed notice is genuine before they will proceed with the deregistration. In that case, under AB, you should add that the electoral registration officer should um, verify that the signed notice is um, true and accurate before that person is included in the omission list. So it seems that there should be this requirement and should be spelled out in this clause. Mr. Lee. Actually, that's um, what we're proposing to amend. Now, why do we send the register post? Is to make sure that the person uh, is made aware that uh, his application has been received and processed. And on the legal advisor's point, the signature. Well, there is not a procedure to verify the signature because uh, we don't rely on signature for verification, but rather we rely on a procedure to verify whether an application is bona fide. So after the election production office has dealt with the application, then we will just send a registered post to the person. We'll make sure that he receives the notice before his name will be included in the omission list. And as I said, before we process the application, because last time I explained, uh, over the year we don't receive many of such applications of the registration. And in any one year, maybe we just received about 100 or 200 cases. Uh, there was one year when there was a large number of uh, the registration applications, uh, 2012, because we um, conducted a complete survey. So there were 1,800 cases. But then by, in 2013, already the number com has come down again. So we don't receive many such applications. And when we do receive these applications, we will actually call the, uh, the voter to ask whether he's actually submitted a notice uh, to deregister. 
and only then would we process this application and then we send a registered postal. Right now, we believe that the procedure will follow is sound enough. So, um, if you send two registered posts and they still return, then you won't process the application right, and then you will actually initiate another process to check whether the address is still accurate. That is, whether the person has moved. And so, you won't actually proceed with the um, processing of the, the registration application in such cases. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman, your understanding is correct. Now, if we deal with um, voters' re the registration application, we have any doubt, we actually will not uh, deregister. That's the uh, approach we adopt. Now, if we, uh, we see, find a, a registered post is returned, we might suspect that the address is not correct, and then we will conduct investigation um, in the you know, in that direction. Now you say because now on the registration form there are phone numbers, so you will usually call the voters. Yes, correct. As I said earlier, and when we receive such applications, because there aren't many of them, we want to make sure that no one is um, impersonating the person is submitting the notice. So we will always call the voter. Now, if um, the voter has uh, registered the phone number of us beforehand, uh, before, then we will always call first. Now, my only legal advisor, well, my only concern is that um, sub section A, B, there are two conditions to be satisfied. It seems that it's not spelled out here, so you don't need to satisfy both conditions before the name is included in the mission list. You know, the investigation you carried out is not uh, included here. Is there any way to address the concern of the legal advisor? Mr. Chairman, perhaps later on, perhaps with the Bureau, or the uh, colleague uh, with the colleagues of the Department of Justice, we will see what we can do. Now, in our verification process or in the notification process, perhaps what we can do, or well, this is just my thinking, that let's say a registered post is returned, or if we have any suspicion that the notice could not reach the applicant, then we will not proceed further with the application. So perhaps to some extent that could address the concern of the legal advisor. Mr. Tammy Chung. War. Um, can I ask Mr. Lee whether um, there was a uh, previous case of um, someone um, um, uh, applying for um, inclusion in the uh, omissions list um, um, for another person? Um, so were there such uh, fake applications or say uh, someone may uh, want to be a candidate and then another person may um, on his be um, uh, pretend to be him and um, um, apply for inclusion in the om omissions list and as a result this person can no longer be a candidate. Now in fact every year there are only about 100 or 200 um, cases uh, of um, application uh, to be included in the um, omissions list. But then, um, now, uh, um, do you, sometimes um, is it that there may be suspicious cases because, um, say, if a person has um, registered as a voter, he can choose not to um, cast his vote. And why is it that he has to um, apply to be included in the omissions list? So will you um, investigate um, suspicious cases? Now, the reasons given are mainly uh, immigration or um, um, too old um, and uh, uh, not um, um, being able to uh, go to vote, or is it that some may uh, not want to um, receive the um, uh, campaigning materials? Ms. Ellis Mack. Yes, um, I do agree with the legal advisor uh, in that we don't know what investigation work you do. It's, uh, yes, you said you would uh, make phone calls, you would carry out investigation, but then when we um, do voter registration uh, for the Kai Fongs, many of them are reluctant to um, provide um, too much information. They merely um, provide their names, um, addresses, and they do not want to provide um, their telephone numbers um, or their email addresses. So you can only write to them. I think in most cases, and also in 2010, um, 
there were cases oh, uh, where voters received your letters and then they uh, approached me and they said that they want they didn't want to be a voter anymore. They didn't want to um, remain on the register anymore. They said it was too um, troublesome. So if um, because of certain incidents, many people want to apply to be included in your missions list, and uh, it seems that you have to carry out um, uh, investigation uh, in relation to such cases. So what are you going to do? Yes, Mr. Lee. Now this is a voluntary registration system, Chairman. And if we require the um, electors or the voters to um, provide us with a, a lot of information, then that may um, um, deter people from getting registered because some people may not want to provide us with their mobile phone numbers or email addresses, although we do encourage newly registered voters to provide us with their email addresses. But then uh, um, some voters may um, decide only to provide the uh, um, minimum of amount of information uh, required, in other words, the name, the ID card number and the address. and. And then, if um, uh, there is an uh, if we receive an application um, from them to be included in the missions list, we'll have difficulties because we can't make phone calls. But of course, the address is the most reliable um, information. So we'll, uh, of course, write to um, the voter concerned um, to ascertain. Um, his intention to be included in the omissions list, but then it's a voluntary registration system, and so we can't um, make it um, compulsory for uh, voters to provide us with um, other personal particulars like mobile phone numbers and so on and so forth. But um, uh, what if you can't ascertain or you can't contact um, the voter? So will you still include his name in the omissions list? Now I have to make sure that a voters' right to vote will not be taken away uh, un um, unless um, I can be certain that this is really um, his wish. And so if I um, can't really contact the um, voter or the applicant, then I, I will not deal with the application. But it seems that you can only write to um, uh, the voter to ascertain his uh, wish. So you can only rely on his address. You can re uh, only rely on um, uh, uh, writing a letter to him. Um, so um, in fact, that's no different uh, from um, the voter writing to you that he uh, wants to it, um, uh, be included in the omissions list. Now, if uh, he writes to us and I uh, and I see another address, then I will send the uh, letter to both addresses. And the law requires us to send the letter to the voter by registered mail. And um, I think the voter has to show the sum of the responsibility. Now, if the voter has written to us uh, seeking uh, inclusion in the um, omissions list, and then if um, he uh, hears um, nothing from us, um, then I I think uh, he should um, uh, or he will want to contact us. Yes, I just want Mr. Lee to uh, consider. Um, such situations. Now, uh, of course, we understand that you'll carry out investigation, but what if there are lots of applications for inclusion in the omissions list? Will you be able to cope? And we, we need to uh, uh, be assured that um, voters' uh, right to vote will not be taken away uh, easily. Yes, I think this is a very important principle. We have to, we have to make sure that you uh, can ascertain with the uh, voter his intention to be included in the omissions list before you um, really um, put his name in the omissions list. All right, uh, we... Uh now have uh, we now move on to page fifty three, fifty four, and fifty five. Uh, um, these uh, amendments are very similar to those proposed for um, GC election voter registration uh, regulations because um, this is about uh, voters uh, re voter registration for election committee subsectors. And we have uh, 
reference to the omissions list, and it is said that um, um, there should be um, notification to the uh, returning officer in writing. This is page um, 61. All right, then I think we can move on to page 56. Ms. Chong. Page 53 and 55 relate to uh, natural persons and uh, organizations so they can inform the um, returning officer that they uh, want uh, to get the registered and they want their names to be included in the omissions list. And then concerning uh, section 7, it's just to um, change the reference and we've got um, 7 capital A. The returning officer needs to uh, send out a confirmation by uh, registered mail. All right, I think uh, we can now move on to page 56 and page uh, 57 and page 58. 58 to 61, Chairman. They are very similar to the um, um, amendments we've uh, just seen. And here we're talking about amendments to the uh, village representative election regulation. So we have um, the two uh, new two capital A. Um, if um, um, someone uh, sends out a um, written notice, then uh, the name of this person should be included in the uh, omissions list. All right, next page sixty. No change. Page sixty one. Uh, Miss Chong. Chairman, and in fact, as to say, as to say, the uh, ERO uh, needs to acknowledge by registered post the receipt of the notice. All right, um, page sixty-two, page sixty-three, page sixty-three, electrical ordinance, page sixty-four. Yes, uh, Miss Chong. Page sixty-two, sixty-three, and sixty-four, Chairman. Um, they um, relate to amendments to the electrical ordinance. And uh, there will be a provisional register, and um, certain names need to be removed from the register. And we are saying here that uh, for persons who have given uh, written notices to the uh, ERO seeking the registration, their names should no longer appear in the register. And then page 64, again, this is similar. The notice in the Gazette um, um, should uh, include the omissions list, and the omissions list um, should include um, the names of voters who have um, given written um, notice to the ERO. And for 5 capital A, in fact, the uh, provisions are the same. Thank you. Right, no problem. Um, page 65, uh, amendments to the Rural Representative Election Ordinance. Page 65, Ms. Chong. Page 65 and 66 contain amendments to the Rural Representative Election Ordinance. The amendments are very similar to those proposed for the electrical ordinance. And concerning the provisional register, uh, it should not contain names of those who have sought the registration. And then uh, in the omissions list, um, um, the names of those who have sought the registration uh, should appear in this omissions list. Thank you. All right, page 67. And um, this is the um, EC um, um, subsector election. And um, this is uh, in relation to the District Council Functional Constituency. This is to allow uh, electors to register for the uh, District Council Second FC. And so it's CAP 541 sub let B. Um, that, that's uh, Section 19, um, Subsection 1. District 
Council Second Functional Constituency, the Provisional Register, and the uh, reference to this Provisional Register is deleted, and we're now um, deleting this reference so that the ERO may receive applications um, um, to be included in the um, District Council Second FC Register. But because there was um, the, um, I want to say that there is, there is the new DC Second FC, um, so the arrangements have already changed. All right, uh, page 68, page 69, no change, page 70. Um, Page seventy. Um, um, these are on the electoral procedures. And these amendments relate to the notice requirement for appointment of polling agents and counting agents. At previous meetings, um, mem some members suggested that we should revert to the um, original provisions. So we need to look at this part again. Uh, there are certain parts in Part 5 relating to the notice requirement for appointment of polling agents and counting agents. Some of the amendments are technical in nature. Others uh, relate to the electronic transactions exemption order or exclusion order. And so we may need to... Um, provide some uh, CSAs um, for members to consider. So is it that the administration has decided not to um, amend this part? Because last time, um, there was no consensus among members on this issue. And um, um, uh, is it that the administration has decided not to make any change? Under Secretary. Yes, Chairman, I can confirm that we've um, already um, heard um, members' uh, views and we have decided to err on the cautious side, uh, having uh, taken into account members' views, so um, we, we are not proposing any change uh, in this exercise. All right. Ms. Chong. So uh, which page should we now turn to? I think we should now go to part 6. Now there are certain provisions in part 5 that we want to keep. And so um, we will work out the um, CSAs um, and, and then we will... Um, um, I'll give them to members later. All right, so let's move on to uh, Division 6, and that's page 99. All right, page 99. All right, um, thank you, Ms. Chong. Yes, Chairman. Division 6 relates to notices and correspondence um, between the um, uh, Chief Electoral Officer and the voters. And here we are saying that um, uh, emails um, will be um, allowed as a mode of delivery. And that's why we have um, included um, email. Uh, and perhaps members can refer to Section 23, um, um, appointing election agents and the notice, and also the withdrawal of such notices. So members can refer to page 99 to 101. And we're here we're talking about such notices. The stated here for these notices, they could be delivered uh, by hand or faxed or uh, uh, posted, and uh, they could also be sent by email. Any questions? No? Then page 102 on the Chinese version. The um, Electoral Affairs Commission, Electoral Procedure Legislative Council Regulation. Here, here this uh, amendment is similar. That is, um, on um, 
um, authorizing pol uh, uh, polling agents and so on, how the notices could be submitted or withdrawn. Again, here we have allowed for electronic means of delivery. So it takes us all the way to 107, right? Uh, by mail, uh, email, and so on. So these are all included, right? No questions? Page 108, District Council. Again, it's about the electronic means of delivery. Ms. Chung. Yes, Mr. Chairman, again, starting from page 117 of the English version, a similar amendment is uh, but, uh, is for the District Council's electoral procedure. Uh, it's about um, appointing the uh, polling agent and uh, election agent and so on, you know, notice um, of appointment and notice of revocation and so on. Here, again, we've included the electronic means of delivery. So they'll take us to 113. And next now. Page 114 in the Chinese version, that's about the rural election, or, or village representative election, rather. Yes, it's page 123 on the English version, village representative election. Again, here we've included the electronic means of delivery. So the relevant parties may submit notices, such as uh, appointment of uh, election agent, and so on. In um, section 22, uh, three capital A, here we have um, um, amended the reference. Maybe we have to go back to part five when we look at appointment of agents. Uh, if we are not going to make any changes there, then we may not need to update this as well. So but we'll see if there's a need for corresponding amendment to this. So that it will take us all the way to 117 and then 118 parts um, 7. Ms. Chung. Thank you. Part 7. Now, um, in Lechko, election many may have two votes, so if there is more than one l voting list, uh, we propose to issue the voting list to the voters in one go. And when the voter goes to the same polling station, he should cast all the votes in one go. So. Um, Section 53 on page 128 of the English version. Here we have uh, added the new subsection 4, capital A. That is, uh, if an elector is entitled to be issued with two or more ballot papers, all the ballot papers must be handed to, over to him at the same time. No questions? Page 119, 53A. Yes, yeah, starting from... Uh, page one three zero in the English version. There's a sub, uh, there's a section three three a in the existing fifty three a. There are two con uh, scenarios. That is, a voter may have um, uh, received a ballot paper. He doesn't vote at that moment. He will have to go back to the voting station polling station later on. But these are special cases. Uh, it was explained uh, when we explained the policies because the voter was indisposed or whatever. So on the basis of this provision. We've uh, added this provision. That is, if he's been issued more than one ballot paper, so this is how we deal with it. So, 53A, section 53A, you can see the amendments have to do with uh, changing it from one ballot paper or one or more ballot paper. Or if not all the votes uh, are, is cast, then we may say the uncast vote or all votes and whatever. So it's just to change the meaning from one ballot paper to more than one ballot paper if it, it is applicable. That's all. Questions, please? Page 120 in the Chinese version, or page 132, or page 131 in the Chinese English version. So again, it's the same case. Maybe um, a voter hasn't cast all the votes, and he could still go back to cast the votes uh, in special circumstances. So in this provision, we just want to spell out clearly that uh, if uh, the voter has more than one ballot paper, and there are these special cases and what the arrangement is like, so uh, it's um, included here. Questions, please? No? Page 
one two one one two two no amendments. Uh, it's the same for page one two two. Miss Chung. Page starting from one two two. That's part eight. Uh, that's English version starting from one three three part eight. Um, it's about the main counting stations. Now, uh, as uh, we explained the policy, we mentioned this point. We propose to streamline the reference provisions uh, in relation to counting procedures at main counting stations because right now there is this requirement for main counting stations first they have to check the number of uh, ballot papers uh, before they start counting the votes but then this the provision is not necessary so we propose to delete it what we propose to do is that first for small polling stations uh, or other stations, um, if the votes are sent to the main polling station, then we just verify the um, uh, voters' list, and then um, we will count the votes first before we verify the total number of ballot papers received. So that's how um, the procedure will be like. That's why we're proposing to amend the legislation. First, the electoral um, legislation and miscellaneous um, electoral procedure legislation regulation cap five four one sub letch B D. First, the definition. Um, that's the corresponding amendment. Because in the provisions later on, we have made some amendments. Page one three one, um, section seventy four A. is about the procedures in the district uh, main polling stations. It's mainly about one B. We have uh, we are proposing amendment to the provision because here it says they will first count the number of ballot papers in each um, ballot box, but it's not necessary to do so. So that's why we're proposing to delete this. And it's been replaced by the section, and then there will be section 4B. Uh, that's the newly proposed. That means there's no need to count twice. Page 132, no change. Page 133, Miss Chung. It's the same. Yes, page 133 is also to amend section 74B of the same regulation. It's about um, electrical election by election uh, at the uh, uh, geographical constituencies. It's the same, uh, uh, it's very similar to section 74A. No questions? Page 134 in the Chinese version is the same. Page 135, no change. And then page 136. Ms. Chung, page 136 is to amend the District Council electoral procedure. The, again, the amendment is very similar. It's to amend section 75 so that um, for District Council elections, what the voting procedures like, uh, county procedures like at the main polling station. They're similar to the um, amendments in part uh, in Division 2. Next one three seven. Miss Chung no amendment here. Uh, page one three nine then. One three nine is the same as the last one, because um, there are amendments to the provisions later on. So that's why there's no a need to update the references in the definition. Page one forty one four one. All the way to one four seven. Ms. Chung. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Page 147, Village Representative Election. This page 162 in the English version uh, is again about the um, counting procedure. In the original section 61, there's reference to the ballot paper in the ballot boxes, and this has to be counted first. Again, it's n not necessary to do so now. So that's why we propose to amend um, subsection 1 capital A 
here is stated to, to be stated clearly that um, we will first count the ballot papers coming, f the number of ballot papers from the other polling stations, and then this ballot papers will be mixed with the ballot papers at the main polling station. And then in page one four eight, subsection one b and one c. Well, here the amendment is different than that for the other division. Uh, we're taking this opportunity to do something about the vote counting procedure for village representative election. We just want to make it clearer that they say in a course of counting, um, ballot papers are mixed. Um, uh, you know. Uh, have been wrongly mixed them um, for different rural areas, then these ballot papers must be sorted out first f to according to each rural area, and then the um, receptacles will be delivered to the respective um, root returning officers, and the, the returning officer, having received them. Um, ballot papers from the relevant rural areas, they he, they must do counting and verification. So that's what 1B and 1C are about. They're, they are just to include these uh, procedures for clarity. Questions, please? No, then page 149 in the Chinese version or page 164 in the English marked up copy. Again, it's about the village representative election. It's about the interpretation, right? Yes, um, page one four nine could be read together with one five zero. One four seven, one four eight. Uh, it's just about the first half, the second half now of the amendments. Is that uh, after the ballot papers are mixed, uh, there will be counting, and after counting. Then we'll be we'll find we'll get the number of uh, ballot papers of each polling station, and we'll verify that uh, with the um, uh, voting return. So that's what it is about. Thank you. I understand that this um, rarely occurs in rural representative election. I think the possibility is very small. Is that the case, Ms. Chung? Yes, I think I'll invite um, the representative from the Home Affairs Department to explain. So, um, BRs, uh, or uh, rather the indigenous villagers can vote and also the residents can vote. And in the same village, um, in, at the same polling station, we may be dealing with um, both the um, uh, indigenous representative election and the composite um, uh, resident um, representative election. Now, say for example, um, be, uh, people may uh, put their ballot boxes uh, or ballot papers in the wrong box. So we just uh, want to spell out clearly that um, uh, um, um, we, we, we will take certain steps if we discover um, ballot papers belonging to uh, um, another group in the ballot box. So, uh, but I, I do agree that this um, seldom happens. All right, I think we can now move on to um, part nine, page one five one, and that's page one six six of the English version. Yes. Um, the amendments uh, are, are relate to the uh, what the um, election agents can do. Um, we have three amendments. First of all, let's look at page one five two, the um, EAC electoral procedure legal regulation concerning the election agent. Uh, uh, what he does has the same effect as um, um, that um, uh, which has been uh, done by the uh, candidate. And uh, we're now um, adding the words under this regulation. So that's uh, um, to uh, um, state clearly that the election agent um, may do things that um, the candidates can do, but then we're not covering the uh, ECICO and also the um, uh, signing and the submission of the um, uh, statements. Uh, so um, in the past, there was this gray area, is that right? Um, I, I think now we are spelling out things more clearly. All right, 
154 and then 1515 uh, 155 please Miss Chung. A uh, one five six. Uh, it's in fact um, the the amendment is the same. Uh, it's just to um, repeat the same spirit here. The purpose is to spell out that the election agent can um, exercise the powers of the candidate uh, under this regulation. Right then, uh, I think we can now move on to part 10. Part 10. Uh, these are amendments, Chairman, relating to the postponement or adjournment of election polling or counting. If um, there are material uh, or major irregularities uh, concerning um, election polling or counting, and then postponement or adjournment may be required. And we want to um, uh, change the uh, adjournment from two days to 14 days. That's the first thing. And then second, we want to state very clearly that if there is um, a public health danger, then... Um, Again, the um, election can be um, postponed or adjourned. All right, so uh, I think we can now turn to page 162. Ms. Ho, I've got two questions. I understand that um, here, here we're talking about um, public health. Um, I think here we are referring to um, avian flu. Um, but who who will make a decision, the REO or the um, Secretary for Food and Health? Uh, in fact, it says danger to public health or safety here. So uh, public safety um, is still... Um, one factor. Yes, uh, in the past we had public danger, but now we have this new element, public health. So who will have to say, um, the REO or the Secretary for Food and Health? Yes, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, there will be some con uh, contingency arrangements, Chairman. The EAC or the um, presiding officer may make the arrangements. And of course, we'll make reference to the uh, professional in advice from uh, the department's concern, for example, in terms of whether the Hong Kong Observatory, and then uh, when we're talking about um, public safety or public health, we need to um, uh, listen to the advice of the Security Bureau or the Food and Health Bureau. So we need to get the professional input of the uh, bureaus or departments concerned, and then a decision will be made. So in other words, um, you will um, seek the advice of the professional departments first. Um, for contingency arrangements, there will be a committee, and the committee makes a decision after having consulted the uh, relevant um, bureaus um, and departments. And ultimately, the decision will be made by the EAC. Yes, uh, Ms. Ho, I want to ask about um, public health here uh, concerning um, um, unrest um, um, or, or um, um, lack of order at polling stations. I'm sure the uh, police can handle such situations. And you, you say you need, uh, and of course you also will have to uh, listen to the views of the professional departments. But then uh, if we're talking about public health, then I uh, think um, the um, the uh, the uh, polling territory wide will be disrupted or affected, and as a result, uh, polling has to be um, stopped, and that's um, definitely um, um, a, a major incident that we that we are talking about. And uh, and say if there is an epidemic, then uh, it's the, dep the director of health who can declare that there is um, an epidemic. And I'm sure if there's an epidemic, not only one or two polling stations will be affected. Um, in fact, um, uh, polling uh, over the territory will be affected. So I want uh, to have a paper from you on uh, who can declare um, a state of um, danger to public health or an occurrence of public health danger. Yes, um, 
will be giving a paper to the CA panel on uh, on the um, arrangements. Um, but of course, um, uh, the decision will be made by the EAC, and um, we will, as far as possible, uh, formulate some objective um, benchmarks and guidelines. But then we need to strike a balance. We uh, we need to have objective guidelines, but then these guidelines must not unduly restrict the discretion to be exercised by the EAC. So uh, I, I promise that um, uh, I will um, give the CA panel a paper on the uh, practical arrangements. All right, so I think it's more appropriate for us to follow up on this matter in the panel. Ms. Ho... Uh, wants to make sure that the uh, professional departments will be involved. And when we're talking about uh, an occurrence of public health danger, then uh, the hospital authority, the Department of Health or the Bureau uh, will need to be involved. Mr. Long Chi Chang. Yes, Chairman. Now concerning... Um, um, postponing and adjourning uh, polling or, or the election. Uh, uh, that's of course a very important and yet difficult decision to make. Uh, the uh, present version before amendment is other occurrence of public danger. So uh, we're talking about um, um, matters or incidents and um, causing um, danger to the public. And uh, now we're talking about danger to public health or safety. And we no longer have the word other. So is it that um, your powers will be restricted? Let me give an example. What if uh, there is a major traffic accident or disruption? And, and you know, um, uh, our railway system may um, break down, and as a result, people uh, will have difficulty uh, going to the polling stations to cast their votes. I think the word other gives um, a lot of flexibility to the EAC. But then uh, if this word is deleted, then um, the hands of the EAC may be uh, unduly tied. Mr. Lee, um, now the amendment will not um, narrow or restrict the uh, EAC's discretion. We're talking about danger to public, um, a type uh, riot or open violence or any danger to public health or safety. Um, in the panel, we said that, uh, in fact, uh, an occurrence of public danger uh, should, in, uh, should cover an occurrence of public health danger. But then um, after discussion, it was said that um, we should um, spell out um, public health. And so um, our powers have not been uh, restricted. Oh, no, because um, the original reads, any other occurrence of public danger. Here we're talking about postponement or adjournment of election polling or uh, poll or count. And um, what if there is a, a major um, occurrence, and um, uh, uh, but it doesn't amount to a riot? For example, what if there is um, a, a breakdown um, of our railway system? Um, say, what if the breakdown lasts for um, half a day or a few hours? And will you compensate the um, uh, electors for the time lost. The EAC may think um, that 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 shouldn't um, really be a problem. But what if um, candidates um, um, uh, lo lodge an appeal? What if they feel that um, um, electors should be given extra time um, to um, cast their votes? I I'm of the view that. Um, it's it, there are advantages uh, in um, being a very um, definitive and specific um, in the provision because that would um, um, that the EAC would uh, decision would um, look fairer to the public. But at the same time, I think the EAC needs some flexibility. Uh, uh, perhaps, um, Mr. Lee, 
can tell us whether the um, new version um, is um, narrower or wider in scope. My, my understanding is that, in fact, the scope is wider than um, the original version when there is the word other. And um, Um, and concerning any danger to public health or safety, does that include uh, ma a major disruption to public transport services, for example? Mr. Lee. Yes, I'll try to explain, and of course, the D of J can supplement later. Now, concerning the amendment, I don't think it um, will um, expand or uh, restrict the scope of discretion. It's just that we, we're we trying to be more specific. In other words, any danger to public health um, is um, one scenario to be considered. And then uh, members ask, um, ask us, for example, concerning riot or open violence or any danger to public health or safety. I think this covers um, a very wide scope. I think uh, riots or open violence um, are, are, are easy to imagine. But then uh, I think um, other incidents um, making it difficult for voters to uh, cast their vote at polling stations will also be included. Say, if we're talking about a major disruption to the public transport service, I think it if um, this is uh, um, a territory-wide problem, say if there is a major blackout, making it difficult for our major transport systems to continue uh, operation, that would definitely affect um, uh, uh, voters. It will be difficult for them to go to the polling stations. And um, it's and then there is um, subsection three, and that is an occurrence which appears to the commission or the specified person to be a material irregularity relating to the election, the poll, or the count. And if there is such an occurrence, the commission will also need to consider whether the election, the poll, or the count should be um, adjourned or postponed. Uh, perhaps Mr. Mo can supplement. Yes, I think I uh, tend to agree with Mr. Lee. I think the scenarios covered by the original version uh, will also be covered uh, by the new version. It's just that we have um, in the new version or the amendment spelled out public health. All right, then I think we can move on. All right, um, public health or safety and also uh, 14 days. Uh, page one six eight one six nine one seven zero. District Council, and then one seven one. Miss Chong, is this also on um, the rural um, representative election? Uh, yes, this is um, the uh, uh, the amendments to the electoral procedure rule, representative election regulation, and the amendments are very similar to the amendments proposed for the district council um, election. Here we have the reference to a uh, danger to public health or safety, and this is one of the reasons for deciding to postpone or adjourn an election. Page one seven five. The electrical election. Again, uh, it's about the 14 days and then the um, public health or danger reference. No questions? In that case, uh, let's move on to 177. Ms. Chung. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Starting from 193 of the English version, part 11. Man, uh, that is amendments relating to ordinary business hours. We just are clarifying the definition. Can I refer you to page one eight one? Definition of ordinary business hours. Actually, what we would like to clarify is that uh, for Saturday mornings, uh, those business hours only apply during an election period. It's only when there's an election that um, the office will be open on Saturdays to deal with um, election issues. So that's why we added a B to state clearly 
that is the date of publication of notice in respect of an election, from starting from that period to the date of publication of the result of the election during that period. This is the time when the office will be open on Saturdays. Okay, let's move on. One eight four, one eight five, one eight six, one eight seven, one eight eight. It's still about the business hours. Uh, no question. Then we move on all the way to one nine five village representative election. Starting from 192 actually for the village representative election. Here again for ordinary business hours. That's uh, just to be defined. I don't suppose you have any questions? And then let's um, move on to page 202, part 12. Ms. Chung. Yes, part 12, um, page 2 to 3 in the English version. It's the destination of polling stations, counting stations, and ballot paper sorting stations. We have made some clarifications to the provisions. Uh, section 28 right now was stated that the chief electoral officer must um, gazette a notice to destinate the polling station. Um, counting stations and ballot paper sorting station, but there's no mention when he must do so. So we want to make it clear that um, he should do so bef at least 10 days before polling day. I think we've had the discussion and members accept the arrangements. P uh, 203 and 204, Ms. Chung. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We also propose to amend section 29, subsection 1. Here it says that the chief electoral officer must designate special polling stations for persons with disability uh, because they may have difficulty accessing the normal polling stations. So this amendment is really to clarify the uh, arrangement. Because for 90% of the polling stations, now there's no access problem for pe persons with disabilities. So if uh, for a polling station there's difficulty accessing it, then we will then um, designate a special polling station for use by uh, P uh, PWDs. And then our amendment to subsection 3 of uh, section 29, originally the chief um, electoral officer must indicate on the list of polling stations, the special polling stations, but there's no requirement for a gazetto of the list. And uh, earlier in section 28, we talked about the uh, chief electoral officer having to um, gazette a notice to designate a polling station. So here we would want um, this to be included in the gazette um, that is destination of special polling stations. And then page 205 to add 10 days, right? Or page 207 in the English version. To designate one or more polling stations as the special polling stations. Does it mean that for a person with disability, he may go to one or more than one polling station to cast a vote? Is that what you mean, Mr. Lee? The notice says that um, the chief electoral officer would have to designate which um, are the special polling stations for a particular constituency. For persons with a disability, if uh, he has difficulties accessing the polling station designated to him, then he may make a request to the chief electoral officer. And then the CEO may redirect uh, the voter to a special polling station already designated. But it says one or more polling stations. That's in the notice. In the notice, it could be one or more than one polling stations because there are many different constituencies. Let's say uh, we take the district council so you mean for the whole constituency? Yes, it's just one notice covering all special polling stations. 
Next, then, uh, that's the Legislative Council election, and then page 207, uh, District Councils, that's a 2 to 9 in English version. Again, it's about the, at least 10 days before polling amendment. So 207 to 2011 in the Chinese version. Ms. Chung, anything from you? No, not really, Mr. Chairman. And the um, amendments are similar, actually. If I may just say it. The chief electoral officer will, in writing, give a notice to candidates on the um, locations of the counting stations. And now we say that um, at least one working day before polling day, the notice will be made. Uh, but we won't do it so late, actually. So now we're just saying that uh, it should be at least 10 days before polling day. OK, that's the same then. 212, village representative election from uh, uh, two, page 235 in English version. So in Chinese version from 212 to 216. Again, it's the same amendment. Questions, please? No? Then page 217, part 13 or page 240 in the English version, part 13, technical amendments. Yes, um, Mr. Chairman, this is about uh, technical amendments. In Division 2, uh, there are amendments to Electoral Affairs Commission ordinance. We propose to amend some of the definitions. If I may refer members to page 219 or page 241 in the English version, the definition of electoral law. Currently, the definition only covers the C election and um, members of a public body. By members of a public body, the definition here is that only members of the Legislative Council. And then here is covered also members of election committee and rural representatives. And there's no mention of members of district councils. So, therefore, we propose uh, to make it clear here that the electoral law covers uh, elections of members of the Legislative Council as well as members of District Councils and rural representatives. Um, we have. Um, we also want to clarify that it's an election of rural representatives. So all four elections are included, including the election of the Chief Executive. English version, page 241 of the marked up copy in the English version. How come electoral law C doesn't need to be amended? How come? In the English version, two rural representatives that's not been changed. And then um, in the Chinese version, it's a Hong Gao Dai Bill, which is rural representative. But in Chinese, you can turn it to change it to election of rural representatives. How come in the English version, you're not making that change? Mr. Mo? In the English provision, the um, Construction is different than that in the Chinese version. The election, the word election, doesn't come out in each of the subparagraphs. Um, so uh, it's just the offices that are listed out. But in the in Chinese version, the word election appears in each subclause. That's election of uh, those posts of people to those posts. That's the in the ink Chinese uh, construction. So, um, in the original Chinese version, if it just says rural representative, it's not consistent with the Chinese version. But for the English version, there is no need to make this change. Mr. Bo, can you point out which um, where there is inconsistency, please? Because there are too many, I can't read it. In the Chinese marked up copy, page two one nine, the definition of electoral law. You say that um, it said here. Electoral law means any law in force providing for A A uh, or B and uh, whatever A B C D. It just say election of um, something, election of chief executive, um, election of members of a public body, and so on. That's how it is in the Chinese version. So for C, therefore, it should say election of village rural representatives. We can't just say rural representatives. So this um, subject is uh, election, um, and so that's because of different construction in the Chinese English version. Okay, I got it now. Fine, thank you. Two two o two two one.
two 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 three two two four two two five all the way to two two eight Miss Chone. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Two two eight section seven subsection seven constituency um, the definition of constituency, we want to amend that. We want to make it clear that it includes a district council constituency. That's uh, page 251 in the English version. Because now, the currently, the definition of constituency means only a geographical constituency or a constituency of any other description. It does not include a district council constituency. So we have to include uh, at a con district council constituency because in the same um, legislation page uh, 221 in the Chinese version, uh, s section 7, is, is stated there for the Electoral Affairs Commission may make uh, regulations on voter registration. And uh, for such voters' registration, constituencies could be designated. Oh. So that's um, in subsection 7, that's the same term here, constituency. So if the term constituency doesn't in cover a district council constituency, then there will be doubt as to whether the Electoral Affairs Commission may assign voters to the relevant constituency. That's why we need to clarify that. Oh, so it's just to make it clearer. It doesn't mean it's not included, but perhaps before or now it's not as uh, clear. That's all. 229. A word is added. Ms. Chung. 229 is just to add the word B in the English version. Uh, that's page 252 in the English version. So it's textual amendment. Page 203 in the Chinese version. Oh, sorry. Yes. For district election, el district council constituency, you want to add AA. How come for legislative council? You you don't um, do it for electrical, geographical constituency, right? That's B. B is about the electrical. A is for what? A what does it represent? So you add A A. So what A includes? What does A include? Let me clarify, uh, Miss Leung's question you know geographical constituency means uh, that for electrical election there's a definition for geographical constituency here we're talking about um, geographical constituency for electrical election so that's why I've added the district council constituency and then um, and there's also B that's AA and then there's a B that is a constituency of any other description so that will cover everything for electrical election. But before the amendment, already the Electoral Affairs Commission ordinance has been in effect for a long time. So you mean before? That's uh, no legal basis for the district council constituency? No, I just want the government to uh, answer that. Is it the case that before there was no legal basis? <laughs> Um, under um, subsection 7, it says that the EAC can make regulations concerning uh, registration of electors and also um, constituencies. But then um, in the cross-references, maybe um, 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 this is not that clear, and as a result, uh, we're we uh, trying to clarify this. Either you have the power or you don't have the power. I don't, can't see where the logic is. All right, subsection 7A, a geographical constituency. So is it that um, that refers to electrical elections? And and um, and it's not applicable to district council elections. Then, uh, on what basis did the EAC uh, draw the boundaries for the district council constituencies? So you want to know what the legal ba legal basis is? It's because we're talking about um, making laws, and this is a most solemn exercise. Mr. Mo, can you please assist here? Oh, our legal advisor. Well, on the delineation of 
boundaries. Uh, this function uh, can be found in the district council uh, ordinance. Mr. Mo. Oh, concerning the definition of um, pu public body, at that time the two municipal councils were also covered. Um, we just uh, want to state clearly that um, it's the electrical, and so we've um, deleted the reference to um, leg legislative council under uh, public body. Now, because um, previously we were talking about geographical constituencies of public bodies of um, organizations, including the district councils, but then we um, felt that we should be more direct and as a result we um, wanted to spell out LegCo district council because the definition of geographical constituencies will also be affected. Previously we used the term to um, cover district councils as well but now it only applies to the LegCo and as a result we need to include under constituency, a reference to a district council constituency. So um, um, previously, that there wasn't a problem. Uh, this is a technical amendment because of the amendment to the definition. Chairman, I am uh, referring to the English version, and that's page 242. And is that page 217 of the Chinese version? Are you talking about page 217 of the um, um, Chinese version? Public body, meaning a body referred to in paragraph A of the definition of election. And you are saying that, in fact, this includes district councils. Is that right? And then, Chairman page 217 of the marked up copy geographical constituency subject to section 17 means a geographical area having separate representation in the legislative council now because um, um, pre the original version is uh, in a public Body. Now, because I don't have um, uh, all the documents before me, so is it that uh, the original version includes public body and public body applies also to district councils? And so, in fact, um, geographical constituency in a public body, in fact, includes the geographical constituency or the constituency of a district council. Is that correct? Um, public body as well as um, the definition of election. Um, to mean an election um, to uh, elect um, members for these bodies. And um, I think um, one merely refers to LegCo. I think I'll have to study this um, um, before I give a reply. I don't want to um, obstruct the progress of the Bills Committee, but I want to say that um, um, a grey area uh, may be created as a result. So I hope that Mr. Mo can um, go uh, go back to um, the original version and um, um, think of why the amendment is needed now because um, because geographical constituencies I um, feel will include uh, both um, or the election both include district councils or two municipal councils and the LegCo. And I think you need to be uh, clear about this because when I heard uh, Ms. Chung's explanation, I was a bit puzzled. 
Now, why why is it that it only applies to the uh, oh sorry, so the EAC um, powers do not apply to the district council? So I was really a bit puzzled. So, Mr. Mo, can you give us um, a clear explanation next time? And uh, now let's uh, move on to page two hundred and thirty um, election petitions. Um, in fact, uh, this is page two five three of the English version. In fact, it's just to amend the term of Supreme Court to um, read the High Court, right? Page 232, Amendments to the ECICO. Ms. Chong. Page 232 and 233. In the English version, there is the term printed election advertisement. And we just want to make the uh, Chinese um, Translation consistent, and it will be uh, uh, equivalent to um, printed election advertisements. All right, so let's move on to um, page two hundred and thirty-four, um, part fourteen, page two five six of the English version. So uh, this is to um, advance certain statutory deadlines for voter registration by fourteen days. So as you can see, the amendments uh, involve taking out the dates and advancing them by 14 days. But then, uh, considering 29th of June or 29th of August, we've changed to uh, 25th of June and or 25th of August. In other words, um, four days before because uh, out of the um, 14 days, 10 days will be given uh, ten extra days will be given to the uh, public to inspect the provisional register and the omissions list. And the ten extra days can also be used to um, lodge uh, objections or claims. And so, in other words, um, we we should be talking about the twenty fifth of June or the twenty fifth um, of August. Four days. Um, uh, advancing by four days only, and also we have transitional provisions to deal with the uh, relevant dates in 2014 and 2015, and to cater for the changes during that period. Right, so we only see uh, changes to the dates, um, advancing the dates by um, 14 days. In most cases, so I'll um, just um, read out the pages and um, uh, members. If you have any points to make, do um, stop me. In fact, um, the principle has already been discussed and um, accepted by the bills committee. Ms. Chong, yes, Mr. Le, Mr. Le. Apart from 29th of June and 29th of August, uh, for the other um, days, we're talking about advancing by 14 days. All right, so um, uh, uh, if members and the legal advisor detect any um, problems, please um, um, do raise them. All right, the legal advisor has already um, studied um, all these amendments. All right, so all the way to page. Legal advisor, um, which page should we now come to? Uh, I mean, uh, the marked up copy. Page 317, page 318, in fact. So let's um, start from page 319. All right, so uh, that's um, part 15. We've got a few minutes left, and I think we should be able to finish this one. Um, yes, page um, 15, voter registration or elective registration regulations concerning making um, 
false um, representations, um, the offence will um, become an indictable one. And so we want we want to make this clear: making false or incorrect statements. May I refer members now to page three hundred and twenty-five? Yes. So we've got the offences here. Now this is about um, the powers of the EAC, and so. Uh, we are, we're saying that these um, uh, um, are either summary offences or indictable offences. Do right, members have any questions? No? Then um, three hundred, page 327, and that's uh, page 368 of the English version. So we are amending three regulations relating to voter registration. The amendments are similar. We um, are adding the words on conviction on indictment. And um, the fines are, are um, also spelled out. Thank you. All right? Yes? Uh, Mr. Paul Chair, I understand that the... Um, the penalties have not been increased, but it's just that um, the uh, uh, offence will become indictable. So, uh, because um, because um, if you if you have in mind an imprisonment term of uh, over seven years, then um, you may want the offence to be indictable. But then I, w I just want to know why. Um, you want to make the offence indictable now because um, we uh, should um, um, adjourn um, at twelve forty-five. So uh, I will now exercise my power to uh, extend the uh, meeting by fifteen minutes. But I don't think we need fifteen minutes. We'll just finish this one and then uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. We would like to take up the question, please, Miss Chung. Mr. Chairman, actually, we mentioned that before. Now it's turned uh, from a summary offence to a um, indictable offence, so uh, there will be, so it's not, uh, there's no deadline of six months, it's just to make it more deterrent. So I, I don't follow. Six months, you want to uh, avoid the six months um, time limit. So the, even beyond six months, there could still be um, prosecution, right? That's why it's changed from summary offence to indictable offence, but in terms of penalty, there's been no change. No change to the penalties, is that correct? So you're just um, trying to avoid the six months um, time limit. So if there should be a problem, you could still prosecute after six months. Is it because uh, in um, your experience, uh, it takes more than six months to investigate these cases, and in the past you failed to press charges because um, you couldn't meet the six-month deadline? Mr. Lee? Well, sometimes we refer cases to the law enforcement agencies, um, for the six months time limit, in some cases, um, it's not possible to collect enough evidence for prosecution within six months. So that's why we just want to uh, make sure that um, the law could be enforced more effectively and then the law will be more deterrent. That's why we've turned it, uh, we're proposing to change it from summary to indictable offence. Well, I don't think it's just me. Many colleagues have said this before. For such offences, um, they should be administratively dealt with. They, we shouldn't need to involve the ICAC. Now we are relaxing the uh, time limit for pressing charges before there must be reason for the six months. So is it because uh, is n something's changed, it's necessary to relax the time limit, or are we trying to make the law harsher, actually? Mr. Lee, here the offence. Um, is that um, knowingly providing false information. So it cannot be dealt with administratively. That's the first point. Secondly, about the six months time limit, we have the magistracy ordinance. And there's a requirement that for non-indictable offence, unless it's um, specifically 
um, refer to as indictable offence. Otherwise, there's just a six months. So here we're talking about voters' registration. So we have to count the six months. You have to count the time when the voter provides false information. And in most cases, actually, already they would have passed the six months deadline by the time we find out about them. So it would be difficult for law enforcement agencies to take follow-up action. So it's based on such experience. Uh, we believe it's better to turn it into an indictable offence. There will be a stronger deterrent effect, and also law enforcement agencies uh, would have more powers to deal with such cases. Do you have any specific figures for a year, two years, or three years? How many cases um, is it uh, there that uh, you cannot take out take action because you've uh, it's past the time limit? I don't have the information at hand. We'll find out from the law enforcement agencies. Now, why um, are we proposing this amendment? For the 2011 District Council election, after that we received a large number of um, complaints. When we referred the complaints to the law enforcement agency, they shared with us their experience that uh, very often they couldn't take up prosecution because of the six months deadline. So give, give me some figures as from 2011. So we want to know how many such cases there are. Mr. Elilo, we're just trying to learn something here. Uh, the English version 362, indictable or summary. That's the marked up copy. But in Chinese version, you have um, you added 20 odd characters. How come in the original version, you can't just say that uh, for, you know, for all, any indictable summary offense, you know, can't you make it simpler? Why do you have to rewrite that whole paragraph? No, I'm just trying to learn from the Chinese expert. Who's to answer that, please? Mr. Mo? Now, if you refer to the original section 5, or subsection 5, already, already um, this is a long paragraph because there are two elements. The first element is to, um, contravention of the regulation, and the other is um, contravention of the provisions of the regulation. So there are two elements, and now we are breaking it up in the, the, the two elements. So the sentence reads easier; it reads better. That's all, because we are just taking that opportunity to shorten the originally lengthy sentence. Mr. Long, thank you. I've learned something. Mr. Tse. Yes, let, I'd also like to learn something here. If we don't mention indictable or summary, if we just say this is an offence, then does it imply that it can only be dealt with summarily? Or if you don't state it clearly, is it possible that it could be either? Mr. Mo, or legal advisor, can you help, please? Well, Mr. Jay's question is to do with Section 26 of the Magistrates say, Ordinance. If there's no mention of the time limit for taking a prosecution in six months, it's different. In Hong Kong, we, you have to say it's indictable. Uh, but in the UK, it's the other way around. So uh, before, if there's no specific mention, then automatically the magistrate's ordinance will apply, and that's why there is a time limit. Yes, thank you. If there are no further questions, um, the district council election, the electoral affairs commission's village uh, representative election, actually, the uh, here the amendments are similar. So. Okay, so that, um, let's um, finish at uh, page 355. If I may remind members, just now some members are not here. I were not here. If I may remind you, for the um, counting agent. And the election agent. The seven-day notice, the uh, administration is now keeping to the original ordinance. There will be no changes there at all. Uh, but they will, of course, provide um, the amendments to us after the meeting. Other than that, I think we have um, covered everything. 
Now, if uh, I may consult members, we've completed clause by clause scrutiny. So the next meeting, the administration should come back with committee stage amendments, the drafts of those amendments. Okay? And members, if you wish to move any committee stage amendments, you have to provide a draft next time too. The next meeting will be on the 9th of June, Monday, 4.30 p.m. And we would like to resume the second reading debate of the bill on the 2nd of July. That means uh, we have to report to the House Committee on the 13th of June. And then on the 21st of June, that's the deadline for giving notice of uh, CSAs. Yes, that's it. For officials, for giving notice to resume second reading um, of debate of the bill, uh, you have to give notice uh, by the 16th of June to LegCo. Okay, members, please note those dates. On the 9th of June, administration, uh, would you have all the CSAs ready, please? We have uh, a lot of discussion just now. Um, if you if your CSAs are not ready, there's no point having a meeting on the 9th of June. Actually, we sub our next meeting is scheduled for the 13th of June, but we have to give a report to the House Committee on the 13th of June. That's why we have to advance the meeting to two days earlier. And only then could we make the date of the 2nd of July for the resumption of the second reading debate of the bill. Under Secretary, well, it's, it's, things are moving well. I think the time frame we have proposed is the best, but we need time to uh, prepare the CSAs. Can we do this? Uh, this is uh, let's keep to this um, schedule, but uh, we'll have to go back to uh, we'll have to come back to the secretary to see whether we could make that date. So we could set the dates as they are now, but if mm, we couldn't manage, then we may have to, you know, push things back a bit. Now, if you couldn't make the meeting for the 9th of June, let us know soon. Members, please pencil mark also the 13th of June, just in case we can't have the meeting on the 9th of June. Because by the 9th of June, if the CSAs are not ready, there's no point really to have a meeting. Okay, shall we do that? Any other business? Nothing under that. So, meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.